Uh, good day, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in Philosophical Anthropology. The topic of my lecture today is uh, Man as Being and Subject. And I will be dividing my lectures into three parts. Uh, in, this, in the first part, in this uh, lecture, the first part, I will be talking about uh, the notion of being, the human person, uh, the person as a body and soul, and the theory of hylomorphism. In the second part of my lecture, I will be talking about human dignity, uh, the relationship of the person and the world, uh, his lived experience, and individuality and personality. And then in the third part, I will be discussing about the rational soul and the human faculties. So, uh, you can see in the screen the required readings for this, uh, for this lecture, for this discussion. Uh, Aristotle, on, uh, from his book Metaphysics, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, the Summa Theologiae, and then from Jacques Maritain, uh, from his book Person and the Common Good, and then from Carol Betiwa, Thomistic Personalism. So, the philosophers that I mentioned are the main sources of this lecture on man as being and subject. So, we are going to follow the Aristotelian Thomistic uh, tradition. And of course, the Thomistic and Aristotelian traditions influence the philosophies or the thoughts of uh, Jacques Maritain and so let's talk about the general meaning of being. What is being? What is being? Well, first of all, uh, the word being came from the Greek, uh, from the verb to be, to be. So when you use the word being, it's actually a a present, no, the present tense of the word. To be, okay, but in a more philosophical sense, being is a term that refers to anything that exists. Anything that exists. Uh, this means that all things that we see, that we hear, that we think about, are beings because they exist. They can either exist in the physical world or they can exist in the mind. Uh, they can exist now, they have existed in the future, or they can ex uh, they have existed in the past, or they can exist in the future, right? So, anything that, that has existence is being. So, you can say the laptop or the cell phone, which is in front of you right now, exists, or people exist. Uh, your parents, your family, uh, places, they all exist. And therefore, they are all beings. Okay? So these are things that we encounter or perceive in reality. Okay? We see them actually, or some other people have seen them or experienced them. Or in the future, people will also experience them. We have thought of them. And people can also think of them. So, we can see the colors, hear the sound, therefore they also exist. They can also be considered being. Now, the human person exists. You exist. I exist. And therefore, we are all beings. Okay? We perceive them. We relate with them. Okay? So, However, when you talk of the human person like you and me, our teachers, or your teachers, your parents, your relatives, your friends, they are different from the other beings that we have mentioned. Like for example, they are different from the stones, they are different from the laptop, your gadgets, even your books, they are different. Okay? Why? Because the objects that we mentioned are simply objects. Okay? The stone is an object. Books are objects. Okay? 
uh, they cannot feel, they cannot think, okay? They don't have thoughts, they don't have desires, they don't have ambitions. So, yes, they exist, but they are mere objects. A human person, on the other hand, does not just exist. A human person can feel, a human person can think, a human person can desire, he can relate, etc., etc., okay? In this sense, the human person is not just an ordinary object. He is actually a subject. And by subject, we mean any being that does not only exist, but it can think, it can wish, it can desire, it can have problems, you know, it can have aspirations, okay? So, in short, a subject is a being who has interiority, okay? He has interiority. In Filipino, my kalooban, okay? He has his desires, his aspirations, yeah, like for example, you, you have your own desires, you have your aspirations, you have your ambitions, you also have your worries, you also have your, you know, your anxieties, you also have your problems, okay? So these are all parts of our being a subject. So the human person is not just a being who exists, but he is also a subject because he has interiority or he has a subjectivity. He is a subject. But how does a human person or, yes, a person or a subject expresses this subjectivity or this interiority? The person is not just a subject, which means that he has all these intentions and desires and wishes. He actually has a body. Okay? It is through the body that we experience the other person because we can see him physically it is through the body also that he's able to express his thoughts his wishes his intentions his dreams he, even his problems it is through the body that we can you know we can express all these things and therefore we are not just a subject we also have a body and therefore Philosophers would say that the human person is an embodied interiority or subjectivity, right? Now, aside from being embodied, the person is also an individual, which means that a person is unique. No two persons are alike. We are all different. Yes, we all have our own aspirations, our own intentions, our own dreams, and our own desires, our thoughts, wishes, etc. We have, but we have our own respective unique thoughts. Okay, we are, that's why nobody can think for us. Well, we allow other people to do the analysis for us, but eventually we are going to make our own decisions. Okay, so we are all beings because we exist. But we are not just beings. We are human persons because we are we are subject, and we are human person. As human persons, we are not just subjects. We have our body, and as human persons, we are unique. We are all individuals. We do not think and feel alike. We are all different. Okay, uh, nobody can clone us. Nobody can uh, love. I mean, feel how we feel. Nobody can experience how we experience. Well, people can sympathize or empathize with us, but our feelings, our thoughts, our dreams, even our problems and anxieties, our worries are unique to us. Okay? Now, let's move on to the next, to the next topic. What is the meaning of being according to Aristotle? The, the term being or the concept of being have different connotations or definitions in philosophy okay the my explanation of being a while ago is a very general explanation right now the greek philosopher aristotle defined being as whatever is that means whatever that can be the subject of a true 
proposition, which contains the word is or to be. That's why at the beginning of the lecture, I said being is a form of the verb to be. And it can also be expressed in the, uh, in the word is. So, in other words, whatever exists or has existence can be being. Okay, so that is the general understanding of what a being is. Anything that exists. Okay? According to another Greek philosopher, Plato, being is not existence in general, but something that is more specific. Something more specific. For example, a being is a human person, a horse, or tree, or house. So it's not just anything that exists. Okay? So when you say being, it's not just anything that exists because it, does, it must have some specific quality. It must have some specific quality, like horse exists. So the difference between Aristotle and Plato is that specifies a being as a definite, a definite uh, object, like a person. The other philosophers, some of the philosophers, like the existentialists, would interpret existence, it is not referred to any being. It only refers to one specific being, and that is the human person. Only the human person exists. You can call the other beings beings, but for the existentialist, only the human person has existence. And this existence is always unique, it is always individual, it is always concrete. But what do they mean by exist, to exist? Because, well, according to Aristotle, anything that has existence is being. Now, if the existentialist philosopher would say, only the human person has existence, what about the other entities, the other objects? Well, for them, the physical objects are just objects. They call it an it, or they are just present. They're just present or ready for us to be used, for us to, you know, to be manipulated, etc. But what is existence exactly for the existentialist? To exist is to be self-aware, to be aware of oneself, to be aware of one's interiority. In fact, for them, they use the term exist, meaning to stand out, that we can stand out of ourselves and look into ourselves some kind of a self-reflection, see our thoughts, etc., etc. But the other beings cannot do that, right? That's why they said, the existentialists said, only persons exist. <laughs> now, let's go to the meaning of the person. And in this part of my discussion, I will be uh, relying on the idea of St. Thomas. What does it mean to be a person? According to St. Thomas, following the idea of the Roman philosopher Boethius, a person is an individual substance of a rational nature. As a substance, a person is a being and therefore he exists. Okay? Uh, other beings like qualities, uh, size, weight, relations, fatherhood, they also exist. All right? That's why they are also being. But they are not substances because they cannot exist in themselves. A color must exist on something else like a red dress. Without the dress, the red color cannot exist in itself. So it has the it has it must exist through other beings. Alright? So uh, a substance, however, exists in itself. And therefore a human person is substance because it exists in itself. But the qualities of the human person, for example, his physical qualities like being tall, like being attractive, they cannot exist in themselves because it must exist, the, 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 the height, for example, or the physical appearance, for example, must exist on something else. All right? But the human person is not just a substance. Okay? He is an individual substance, meaning he is concrete, he is unique. 
But he's not just a concrete substance. He's also a rational substance. By that, the human person has a spirit. And that spirit is the basis of his rationality. He's a rational, he's an individual substance of a rational nature. Alright? So he's not just a substance that exists in himself or in itself. He has reason. He has rational faculties. He has the faculty to think. He has the faculty to, to will. He has the faculty, he has the power to decide. And all these rational faculties are based on the rational soul or the spirit. Okay, so, so the human person has a spirit, okay? not just a body, he has a spirit. Now, in the physical world, only the human person has a spirit. Only the human person has a rational faculty. The other beings in the physical world, well, the first, the lowest are the inanimate objects. The inanimate are the physical objects. They don't have soul. They don't have spirits. They don't have rational soul. The animals, they may have soul, but they are not called spirit. Only the human person has a spirit. And because of his spirit, he has also the rational faculty. So this is manifested in the two properties, rational qualities, reason or intelligence and will or volition and because of these properties or because of these faculties the human person therefore is always a rational and free individual let's move on to the next the human person as composed of body and soul so from the what i have already said when you say human person there are two important components that we should remember. We have our body and we have our soul. Okay, The soul of man is called spirit or a rational soul. And it is the rational soul that gives man his spiritual capacities or faculties of intelligence and will or volition that makes him a person. Of course, he is also his own body. Okay? And it is through the body that he manifests his other faculties or his other powers like the power of uh, nourishment, okay? the capacity to nourish ourselves, the capacity to grow, the capacity to reproduce, the capacity to see or perceive objects, the capacity to, to feel. We are able to do this because of our body. So man or the human person is both a spiritual and corporeal man is composed of both body and soul now the question is how do we explain these principles of body and soul or the composition of man as body and soul this is based on the theory of aristotle called the theory of hylomorphism so aristotle explains this composition and relation of the body of man as body and soul through his hylomorphic analysis or the theory of hylomorphism. The word hyle means matter and the word morphe means form. So hyle, matter, morph or morphe, form. Matter and form. And according to Aristotle, a being which he calls the Osea, is composed of two principles, the matter and the form. According to this doctrine, all corporeal beings are made of these two principles, the, the matter and the form. Now, what is the meaning of the word corporeal? From the word corpus, which means body or bodily. Okay, Corpus means body. Corpse is a dead body. Now, of course, it was first expounded by Aristotle and later on adopted by St. Thomas. And this theory stresses that all corporeal beings, okay, all corporeal, meaning the physical beings, stones, uh, the plants, uh, 
the animals, uh, man himself, we are all corporeal beings. Now, it makes a distinction between two kinds of being, the animate and the inanimate. Uh, first, what are the inanimate? The inanimate are the physical objects. Uh, the term animate from anima, anima actually means soul, and it is equated with life. So anima, soul, life. That's where the word animation actually came from. It's alive. Okay? When you say inanimate, it does not have a soul, and therefore it does not have life. It is inanimate. These are the physical objects. What about man? What about the plants? What about the animals? They are animate because they have life. They have souls. You will be confused because how could your, your pets could have soul? How could your the, the, the plants, okay, the flowering plants, for example, that you take care of have souls? Now remember that soul is anima which means life so all living organisms have life and the principle of that life is the soul the anima okay so uh, let's go back to the notion of matter what is this matter matter is the physical principle of man and this manifested in his having a body so the body is the matter it is the physical what about the form the form is the spiritual principle and this spirituality is manifested by man having a spirit or a soul so the soul is the one that gives life to the body it is also the the you know the it's the one that animates the body it is also the principle that is responsible for all the operations of the body so what happens when the soul leaves the body well the body dies the body is left lifeless what about the soul well the soul of man continues to exist because the soul of man is something that is spiritual it is immortal so for a man to be complete and to live or alive and be functional you know to exercise all his faculties there must be both body and soul they have to be substantially united the soul the spirit is a substantial form of the body the soul animates the body it makes it move it makes it act it makes it operate it makes him make the body do all the other operations but of course, without the body, you will not be a man. We will not be a person. We'll just be pure spirits like the angels. But so both the body and the spirit have their respective powers or capacities. The soul, as we have said, operates through the mediation of the faculties. And the two highest operations or powers of the spirits are, as we have already mentioned, reason or intellect and rational volition through the will it is through reason or the intellect that we are able to uh, gain knowledge that we are able to understand and it is also it is through the will that we are able to make volition that we are able to decide it is through volition that we express our freedom now according to Karol Wojtyla or Saint John Paul II Based on the activities of reason and will, the whole psychological and moral personality takes shape. As a substantial form, as the substantial form of the body, um, aside from the spiritual powers that the soul has, uh, the soul is also dependent on the body. Because again, as I've said, the body or the soul cannot operate, you know, cannot fully operate without the body so what are these faculties of the body 
which are needed by the spirit or by the soul in order for it to operate. Well, it will need the sensory faculties. Uh, it will need the sense of sight. It will need the sense of smell. It will need the sense of hearing. It will need the sense of touch or the, and the sense of taste. Because the, the function of, the, of reason or of the intellect is to know. But how can we know if we cannot perceive things? How can we know the colors if we cannot see them? How can we know uh, the sounds? Or well, how can you even listen to this lecture and understand philosophy if you don't have the sense of hearing? Or how can you watch this presentation if you have the sense of sight? Therefore, for Aristotle, for Aquinas, and for John Paul II, the two are dependent in the sense because the, the body and the, the soul or the body and the intellect are so dependent because one cannot function without the other okay so uh, of course but still all these faculties are found in the human person they are found in the human person and whatever that the body does affects the soul and vice versa we are a what they call a psychosomatic being psyche the spirit soma the body so we are both body and soul and they are you know substantially united they are dependent on each other we cannot be a human person without the combination of these two we are both body and soul they have their own differences but they form a unit together in the human person so that's the end of the first part of our lecture uh, what's out for the second part of this lecture on man as a being and subject so thank you very much for listening stay safe